let's worship him. How many know the battle belongs to him, amen? Amen, well, let's worship. And say that the battle belongs to God, not yours.
greatest gift that God has ever given us is salvation through Jesus Christ. And this scripture speaks to that. So this is 1 Peter from chapter 1. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. God is so good, isn't he? Yeah. 
hearts at the same time as we worship God. Lift up your hands, church. Let's lift up your hands. And there's something powerful. As you use Jonah to share the truth to them, oh Lord, I pray that you will use us to share your truth to our neighbors, to our friends in our workplace, to Grand Rapids. Lord, we are willing and we surrender ourselves into your mighty hands, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Church, please take a seat. Good morning, guys. Oh, well, there you go. You guys are awake. How are your coffee? Great. Well, my name is Janit, and I work as a missions pastor here. And uh, we have, like, exciting things coming our way. And I think the first thing is we have a mission trip to Guatemala happening in June. I know, I'm super excited for that. So the informational meeting for this trip is on February 18th after the second service. Lunch will be provided. So if you are interested to go to Guatemala and see the ministry that that we support. Uh, this will be a great time for you to come to the meeting. And the second tri uh, thing is our trip to the community of Ukra in Ethiopia. And we went there last year in October. We're going back there again in October this year. And the informational meeting for this trip is on 5th, 25th during the second service. And there's a time for you to know all the information about the mission trip and what's going to happen and the details on the itinerary and everything else. So, um, and people often ask me, like, why do we go, go to this mission trip? What do we do there? So, this is what we don't do. So, we don't go to, on these mission trips to solve their problems. Uh, we don't go there to fix things, or we don't go there to, like, eradicate world hunger or poverty or change the economy. We don't do any of those. But what we do as Frontline is we go and support the local pastors and leaders. We go alongside them, we encourage them, we bless them, we pray with them, we eat with them, we cry with them, and they are the people who are on the front lines. We are there for a week when we get, come back, but they are the people who are sharing the gospel. They are the people who are doing the evangelism and discipleship, and while we are there, that experience, it doesn't change them, but it changes everything for us. And that's the reason why we go on these mission trips. So if you want to know uh, more about this, um, come to our informational meetings. Or if you want to sign up, you can go to frontlinegr.com slash missions, and you can sign up for these mission trips uh, coming up. So uh, as we go into the time of tithes and offerings, when there's a unique way that we all get to worship God, you know, there's a, like, we get to worship God through songs and prayers. We get to worship God through reading the scripture, through small groups. But... Surrendering our tithes and offerings uh, and giving to God our finances, it calls into a unique challenge. It calls us to humility. So as we pray for our tithes and offerings, as we pray for our service, as Brian comes, I want you to um, put your hand in a posture of surrenderance because you're like not only surrendering your tithes and offerings and everything, but you're also asking God to, like, for your Holy Spirit, for his spirit, so that he can equip us and kind of change our hearts, and work in our hearts. So let's pray for that. 
Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I just want to thank you. Thank you for like bringing all of us together uh, in one place to worship you, uh, to sing and to pray, to listen to your word. So, Father, I pray that you'll talk to us through Brian, to the word uh, he's going to share with us. At the same time, Father, I pray that you'll accept our tithes and offerings. Well, it's a challenge for all of us to kind of surrender that area of our life into our hands. So, Father, I pray that you'll pour out your spirit and give us the faith that we need. In Jesus' name I pray. just didn't fit. Like your story didn't connect with the ancient ones found in the pages of scripture. So let's put ourselves back in touch with the real people of the Bible. People who faced real situations and real struggles. Like Jonah. This less than perfect prophet reveals critical lessons and mistakes for following God into a new year. His story is complex and it's a lot like ours, except for the whole whale thing. But God reveals his love for Jonah and the world in an unmistakable way. Let's dive in. Good morning, my friends. How are you? Good. It's good to see you. Good to be uh, back with you again if you're watching online. Uh, great to have you in the room uh, with us as well. And uh, to this week and next week, we are wrapping up this series we've been working our, our way through in the new year here, uh, talking about Jonah. And actually, at all four churches in the Zero Collective, we've been doing this series together. And just uh, now we're, we're kind of in the final chapter. Jonah chapter 4 is where we're going to be looking today. Uh, and there are only four chapters in the book of Jonah. And so we're, we're wrapping up this story this week and then next week as well. Um, but before we jump into that, uh, today is the Super Bowl. And um, so... Uh, we're excited about that. The Super Bowl is 22 guys desperately need, in need of rest, being watched by millions of people desperately in need of exercise. And so that's what we're going to be doing a little bit later today. If I'm being honest, I'm, ever since the Lions lost, I'm having a little hard time getting into the Super Bowl. Uh, David and I were actually laughing about this graphic we saw uh, earlier this week, and it just kind of shows a map of the U.S. and who's rooting for who at the Super Bowl. So here in the middle, you have Kansas City. Over here, you have, you know, the West Coast, San Francisco Niners, and then everybody else is, can't they just both lose? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I mean, that is exactly how I feel. I'm, so, I'm rooting for both teams to lose somehow in this Super Bowl. I don't know about the rest of you. Some of you are just like, I don't even know who's playing. I just hope Taylor Swift wins. That's all I care about. Uh, and so this is true, though, isn't it? Like in every kind of game, uh, we, we don't just root for a team to win. We also simultaneously root for another team to lose, don't we? Uh, that's that's kind of what makes sports fun. And you know that if, if you root for Michigan, you don't just root for Michigan to win. You root for Ohio State to lose, right, all the time, like any way they possibly can. Amen. That's the, <laughs> Amen. That's, that's great. <laughs> So, uh, but that, that's what we do. And there's nothing wrong with that. When it comes to a game, when it comes to sports, there's nothing wrong with root, rooting for somebody to lose. But the question I want to pose to us as we go into the text this morning is, do we do that with people in our lives? Do, do we root for people to lose in life? Are there people in your life that you sort of actively root for, for them to lose? Confession? Uh, there are people that I compare myself to. I know I shouldn't. And, and I sort of like, you know, feel like I'm competing with them a little bit if I, if I let myself just go down that path to where I sort of am, am rooting for them to lose. Truthfully, and this is horrible to admit, uh, but sometimes it's even other pastors of other churches and other ministries. And, and I know that's wrong. I know that's not the, the way God would have it, but I, I struggle with that. Are, are there people that you root for to lose? Whenever we do that, what we're doing is we're fixing our happiness to someone else's unhappiness. In, in other words, the only way I can be happy is if I know that they're unhappy. And if I find out that they're happy, well, then that makes me unhappy. And when you live that way, when you live a life where that's kind of your outlook, it either leads to feeling constantly angry and frustrated because you feel like they're, you know, uh, kind of getting a better deal than you. Or it leads to feeling superior to them if you feel like they are losing and you're rooting for them to lose. The, the reason I tell you all this is because as we go into Jonah chapter 4 today, Jonah is rooting for the Ninevites to lose. That's what he's doing. 
he has fixed his happiness to the destruction of the Ninevites. We talked earlier in this series about how Jonah's people and the Ninevites were kind of, you know, rivals of each other. And Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. And so Jonah can't stand the people of Nineveh. And he is actively rooting for them to lose and for them to be destroyed. And so he's so unhappy. In chapter 3, if you were uh, you know, kind of with us during the series, you know Jonah finally obeys God. He goes to the city of Nineveh and does what God's asking him to do. He basically preaches a message, and what he says is, if in 40 days, if you don't repent, God's going to destroy this place. R- great message of grace. Uh, and so the people turn, they actually repent, and they actually uh, you know, put on sackcloth and mourn, and they turn their hearts back to God. And Jonah is not happy about the fact that they've done this. You'd think he'd be happy, like, great job, Jonah, job well done, and he's miserable. So let's take a look at this together. We looked at these first few verses last week, and we talked about forgiveness, like interpersonal forgiveness. We're just going to look at these again and take it a little bit further today. It says, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very what? Angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? That's the question God asked Jonah. He asked him to examine his own heart. Is it right for you to be angry about this? And and I would say maybe that's even the question that God wants us to ask ourselves today. Is it right? Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city, and he made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And just to be clear, he's literally sitting there watching, you know, the city just the same way we're going to be watching the Super Bowl later today. He's just hoping to see him get nuked. That's what he's hoping happens. He just wants to see him get destroyed. He's hoping that's what's going to take place. Now, a couple things I'd love to draw out of the text uh, for us. The first thing it says uh, that I want to draw out is it says that Jonah became very, very angry. Now, angry there, when when it uses the word anger, in the Hebrew language, there's actually a couple different words that can be used to describe anger. And just and we understand that, right? There are different kinds of, of, of anger, of being angry. The Hebrew word that's used here is the is the word hara. Let me hear you say hara. That's right. You got to really work up the phlegm there to get to it. <laughs> hara literally means to burn. It means to be hot. It means to be, it's like an intense, furious anger. Okay, so this is not the kind of anger that's kind of like a slow bitterness that just sort of bubbles beneath the surface for years. This is not just kind of like cynicism or, you know, low-grade frustration. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about anger that gets hot and that gets intense right now. It's like a flare-up. Jonah is boiling. In fact, the word, I think, in our English language that comes closest to to what the word hara actually means is our word for outrage. Jonah is outraged. Are you kidding me, God? I get put in the fish, and these people just get off scot-free? How is that fair? He's furious. He's outraged. I I would say we are living right now in what some people have described as an outrage culture. In other words, the point of a lot of the media and a lot of the, the things that we see and that we read, the point is to get us outraged. Hurrah! Boiling with anger at at this person or this group of people, people that we perceive to be in some way our enemies. We have these hurrah flare-ups all the time, don't we? When your ex, who really wounded you, who hurts you, gets on Facebook and starts talking about how great their life is now with their new person. Hurrah! Right? When that teacher who humiliated you, you find out they won the award for teacher of the year. <laughs> Hurrah! <laughs> or or when, when the road construction sign says lane closure ahead, so you get over in the long line of cars, and then some weasel goes all the way down to the very end and tries to force their way in, and some wimpy person lets them in. <laughs> Hurrah! <laughs> right? We know what this is about. 
we understand outrage in our culture. I don't have to go very far or help, but you see, we, we feel it all the time. And we feel it in those kind of things. We also feel it very deeply. For some of us, we've been seriously wounded and hurt, and we are boiling. We're just so angry. These flare-ups happen a lot of times when we perceive that either someone is getting a better deal than me, or that God is somehow offering his grace to someone that I would not offer grace to. That's when we feel these things in our lives. What's interesting here in the text is that, especially in the original language, there is such a comparison being made. It's this ironic kind of take on the difference between Jonah's anger and God's anger. Right? So Jonah's anger is hurrah. But when, but when you listen again, when, it's, when it describes God's anger, Jonah says, I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. So go ahead, if, the next slide, if you will. Just so we're clear, Jonah's anger is quick, and he's slow to love. He's quick to anger. He's slow to love. But God is described as being slow to anger and quick to love. That's what we learn about God in Jonah chapter 4. He's slow to anger. He's quick to love. Uh, as you look at that, which one are you more like? Or better question. Which one would your family say you're more like? My, my family would have no problem telling you that there are plenty of times where I'm a lot more like Jonah. Quick to anger. I'm slow to love. I'm slow to pick up on love. So this morning, I just want to talk for the next few minutes here a little bit about what does God want to say to people like you and me and Jonah? How does God want to change our hearts? How does he want to speak to us and redirect our hearts uh, this morning? What we're going to look at is we're going to skip to the very, very end of chapter 4. We're going to look at the last verse of the entire book of Jonah. If, if you don't know, Jonah ends on kind of a cliffhanger. It's this weird, abrupt ending. It ends with God speaking and basically answering Jonah. He, he's giving Jonah an explanation for why he is slow to anger and why he's so quick to love these people. The Ninevites. And the entire book of Jonah, if you don't know, it just kind of ends on this abrupt ending because the very last verse, verse 11, basically sums up the entire point of the entire book of Jonah. And it's just kind of left unresolved. This is what God says, and it's the way the entire book of Jonah ends. God, speaking to Jonah, says, Jonah, Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? That's God's justification. That's his explanation. Nineveh has 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness. He even cares about the animals. Sh shouldn't I care? That's what, that's what God says. What I love about this is that God knows the exact number, right? Right? At this point in the story, he knows exactly the number, 120,000 people. That's how many people. He's focused on them. That's how many people are living in spiritual darkness. And what's amazing about that, we know that God didn't just care about the number 120,000 because that was just a cool number. God, the number that God actually cares about is the number zero. That's why we talk about it so much around here. It's, it's why we started this whole network called the Zero Collective. It's because we understand that, that what God is actually after is not a bigger church necessarily. What, what God is after is zero lost people in the city of Grand Rapids. Zero people who are living unchanged by Jesus. That's what God cares about. If there was 120 people in the city of Nineveh, that's how many God would have cared about. If there was 1.2 million in the city of Nineveh, that's how many God would have cared about. That, if that was how many people were living in spiritual darkness, because what he's after, what his heart is, is about, is zero people living unchanged by Jesus. We, we forget about this, don't we? A lot, you know, a lot of times we think God thinks like we do. When God looks at Grand Rapids, our city, the greater Grand Rapids area, God doesn't just look at our city and compare the different churches. Well, this church over here, they've got a great kids program. It's way better than the other. This church, though, they've got some killer worship and music. That's where you go if you really... This church, they have some great preaching, Oh, but this church, their outreach programs, you know, that's a great. God doesn't look at the, when God looks at our city, when God looks at Grand Rapids, 
What he's focused on is the 120,000 people. It's, it's the people who are living in spiritual darkness, the people who are lost, who don't have a faith in Christ. That's who he's focused on. That's who he sees. That's what he cares about. And he ends the entire book of Jonah putting Jonah's focus on that as well. So the real question of the book of Jonah, it's, it's really the, the entire question that the book of Jonah has been begging us to ask, we find here at the end of the chapter, is why doesn't Jonah care about the 120,000? Why does Jonah have such a hard heart? Why doesn't he give a rip? I, I mean, literally, you're talking about the guy who was rescued from the belly of the fish, given a second chance, goes to Nineveh, and they all, and you know, a, a good number of the city repent, God spares them. Why is Jonah still so uncaring? Why does he not give a rip about the 120,000 people? And maybe the question for us to ask is, is why do we find it so hard to, to think that way too, and to do that as well? And the answer is, the reason Jonah still doesn't care about the 120,000 is because even at this point in the story, Jonah still does not understand the gospel of grace. He still doesn't get it. Even after the fish, even after his own life being spared, even after being sent on mission to these people, he still doesn't understand how the gospel of grace actually works. And I would tell you, he's not that much different than so many people, even in the church today. It's possible to have grown up in the church, be, be going to church all your life. It's possible to be, to, to be doing everything you can to live a good, moral life, and yet you're still miserable. You're constantly comparing yourself to these people who you feel like are getting a, a better deal than you. You're angry about this group of people and, and why, you know, they're allowed to do what they're allowed to do. And, and your, your heart has not been changed and you still don't understand the gospel of grace. That's where Jonah's at. And God is inviting Jonah to have a heart change. We said it last week at all our churches, but the line we said was, Jonah would rather die than see his enemies saved. Jesus would rather die than see his enemies condemned. That's why Jonah doesn't care about the 120,000, because he doesn't get what the heart of God is actually all about. So, so the main idea I want you to get out of today, the main idea that we're talking about this morning, if you could go ahead to that next slide, is that the best indicator that we have embraced the gospel is our own willingness to offer it to our enemies. Let, let me say that again. I want you to get this. The best indicator that we've embraced the gospel is not how much scripture we've memorized, it's not how good and moral a life we're living and all the good deeds that we could point to. The best indicator that we have embraced the gospel is our own willingness to offer it to our enemies. Because until you have done that, until you can do that, you still haven't really understood how the gospel of grace works. If you go forward to the New Testament of the Bible after Jesus' resurrection, you just see this everywhere. In fact, it's one of those things that once you see it, it's like you can't unsee it. You just see it everywhere in the New Testament. In the New Testament, do you know, we're never really told in the New Testament you should do something because it's the good, right thing to do. I mean, almost never do you see any, anything in the New Testament say, this is, you should do this because the rules say you should do it, and that's the right thing to do. What you see is everything that we're invited to do, everything we're asked to do all throughout the New Testament, all points back to Jesus. It all points back to the gospel as the reason for it. I'll give you some examples. When Paul is talking to the Corinthian church about their giving, they're not being generous, they're being stingy. Paul does not say to the Corinthian church, hey, you guys, don't you know about the rule about tithing? Come on, you know, the whole thing about the first 10%, did you miss that? Come on, why aren't you being generous? That's not what he says. What Paul says to the Corinthians is he says, don't you remember the gospel? That Jesus, though he was rich, became poor, on your behalf, so that through his poverty, you might become rich. How could you possibly not be generous when you understand that? You know, when he's talking to Peter, Peter displays racism in, in, at the Jerusalem Council. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul talks about how I confronted Peter to his face. And what he says to Peter is, Peter, don't you know about the no racism rule? You're not supposed to be acting like a racist. 
No, that's not what he says. What he says is, Peter, don't you remember the gospel? How could you possibly feel superior to anybody? You are a sinner saved by pure grace with no right to boast. To, to husbands, when Paul's talking to husbands in Ephesians chapter 5, he doesn't say to husbands, hey, you guys know about the Ten Commandments, right? You know, don't commit adultery. You shouldn't be looking at porn. That's just wrong. No, no, what he says to husbands is, husbands, we're supposed to love our wives like Christ loved the church. He sacrificed himself for her. He gave himself up for her so that she could be pure and holy. Do you see it? Once you see it, you just start to see it everywhere. When, when the only way we know how to offer grace to others, the only way we really know how to, to follow Jesus and live a good life is when we connect our own experience of the gospel, our own experience of our need for grace to the mission that God is doing throughout our world. In other words, if you have a hurrah problem today, you need the gospel. That's the only thing that can change the human heart, really. It's the only real thing in this world that will change the human heart. We, we need a deeper understanding of the gospel. When I was 12 years old, our family moved from Indianapolis to a small town called Marion, Indiana, in northern Indiana. And the reason we made this move, I've shared this before, is because for my parents it represented kind of a, a, a fresh start. Their marriage was in trouble, and my dad, who was on the road all the time, took a job at a small credit union in Marion so that he would have a job where he would be home every night. So for my parents, it was, let's move our whole family and let's, let's give this one more shot. It was an attempt to try to start over. And so suddenly I found myself kind of uprooted from all my friends and the people that I knew, and suddenly I was the new kid as a middle schooler. I was the new kid in a school. And the thing I, I can distinctly remember about that time uh, being the new kid in school, what I remember is I couldn't look anyone in the eye. Literally, I have this memory, like, uh, like classmates, if they would talk to me, or even teachers, if they talked to me, I just, I couldn't look you in the eye. I just would kind of like drop my gaze and avert my gaze. I, I just couldn't do that. People even would comment on it. And what was going on, what was happening for me was I believed that I was worthless, because of the things that were happening at home and because of, you know, the move, suddenly being a new kid in the school, that, that is the lie I was believing about myself. I must just be worthless. And I, I believe that to the core of my being. For several years, my wife, Carrie, worked as a nurse uh, here in town for a group foster care home here, here in town. And uh, because we're foster licensed, she would regularly um, make you know, connections with kids who were in that group foster care home, and, and uh, she would you know, regularly kind of invite them to come hang out at our house or hang out with us or with our family. And I remember there was this one particular 13-year-old boy who had nowhere to go over any holidays or weekends because of what had happened with his parents and no fault of his own. He found himself in this home and, and like, had nobody, literally nobody. And so I remember her saying, I want you to meet this kid. And in fact, 4th of July was coming up. She's like, why don't we invite him to come? We always go to a friend's cottage over 4th of July. I look forward to it every year. It's like, why don't we just invite him to come with us uh, to the cottage over 4th of July? And I literally was just like, oh, please, no, not again. I wanted to go. I'm like, please don't bring this kid with us. I don't want to do that. I just, I didn't want him interrupting our family time. I didn't want him interrupting fishing time and other things I like to do. And so I was just like, can we just not, not you know, not do that? And she's like, J I, will you just meet him? I'm like, I don't, I don't think so. I don't really want to meet him. And so she was like, well, why don't you pray about that, Pastor Brian? Which is, uh, which is always like her, uh, yeah. It's not as cute as it sounds. Um, so I was like, fine, I'll pray about it. So I prayed about it, and I, I agreed, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll meet this kid. So I'll never forget, she, she brought him uh, over to our house to meet our family. And I meet this 13-year-old kid for the first time. And the first thing I notice about this kid is he won't look me in the eye. Not just me. My boys, he won't look them in the eye. He won't even look Carrie in the eye, the person that he actually knew and had a relationship with. And instantly, just like that, I did not need any more convincing. My heart was changed toward this kid immediately. 
and I, it, suddenly it was not hard to include him. It was not difficult to invite him to come with us for 4th of July. It was not difficult to invest in him, to connect with him, to spend time with him. That all just became suddenly easy. Why? Because I, when I saw that in him, I understood the same hurt and the same pain that was inside of me is, is living inside of him. Even though our stories are very differently, he's experienced things way worse than anything I ever experienced. But the same lie that I believed he was believing. This kid isn't rude. He's not, you know, indifferent. He's, he's not uncaring, all those things that he comes across as. This kid just believes he's worthless. Just like me. And what really happened in that moment was when, when I, I met this, this boy, he reminded me what lost felt like. Have you forgotten what lost felt like? Have you forgotten what hopeless felt like? What worthless felt like? The heart of God is, is for people like me, like him, like you. What changed for me? What why? I mean, when I think back to that 12-year-old kid version of me that couldn't look you in the eye, that feels like it was a totally different person in a different lifetime. What changed? What happened for me? What happened is that at 14 years old, just a couple years after that, the gospel of Jesus Christ came into my life. Uh, we, we got invited to go to church that year. I gave my life to Jesus. I got baptized. And what the gospel told me at 14 years old was the gospel said, Brian, you are not worthless. In fact, you are to Jesus, you are priceless. You are irreplaceable. You are indispensable. You, you are so valuable that Jesus counted you worth dying for. That's what the gospel told me. You know, everything changes when you understand that you were worth dying for, that Jesus valued that, you that much, that you were worth dying for. It changes everything. It's, it's like if I'm a billionaire and somebody steals $10 from me, what do I do? Yeah, I don't freak out and call the police and, and tell them to turn the city upside down until they find that guy that took the $10. No. Even though it was wrong that he took the $10, even though that's still unresolved, if, if I'm a billionaire and somebody steals $10, I look at the billions in my account and I shrug and I move on. And, and what, what the resolve comes from is not getting the $10 back. It's looking at the riches, the value, the worth that I've got in my account. Do you get it? That's what Jesus gives us. When, when we come to this place of receiving him as our Lord and Savior, when we realize that he took our sin on himself and now we have the life that only he earned living inside of us, the billions that have been deposited in our accounts, it changes everything about how we see ourselves, everything about how we see our world. And the things that used to bother us don't no longer bother us anymore. I don't avert my eyes. I don't, I, there's no one I can't look in the eye today. I, I don't bow my head to anyone because I know I am a son of the most high God and I was worth dying for. You get that? It no longer starts, you get that? It, 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 it no longer bothers you that somebody's getting a better deal than you. It no longer bothers you that you, that you feel like you have to compete with these people. You feel like to constantly prove yourself to these people. You feel like you constantly have to kind of one-up these people and win and you're rooting for other people to lose. That All that kind of starts to go away and instead what starts to bother you is the fact that there are 120,000 people in the city living in spiritual darkness. That's what starts to bother you. A church that doesn't care about the lost people in its community is a church that has not been transformed by the gospel. That's not us, is it? David and I were talking. We did some, some research this past summer, I believe is when he, he shared this with you, that from your chair where you're sitting, if you draw a five-mile radius circle from your chair where you're sitting, there's a study done that uh, I think it was 2021, where there are 53,410 people self-proclaimed that they do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ in our city right now. Why should it bother you that 53,410 people right now are living in spiritual darkness in a five-mile radius from your chair? It should bother you because those people are worth dying for. 
Why should it bother us that right now in the city of Grand Rapids, there are three churches for every kid in the foster care system, and they still can't find enough foster care families for a week? Why should that bother you? That's, that's not your kids, not my kids. It should bother you because the gospel tells us those kids are worth dying for. Why should we care about kids? Janine was just talking a moment ago, these trips we're taking in Ucro, Ethiopia. Kids that are unsponsored and their families in Ucro, Ethiopia. Uh, kids and their families in Guatemala who, who are struggling in different, you know, situations of poverty. Why, why should we want a relationship with them? Why should we care about them? Why, why should we? They're on the other side of the world. It's because the gospel tells us that just like us, those people are worth dying for. God says to Jonah, Jonah, there are 120,000 people in this city who are worth dying for. If you don't get that, you don't get anything that I'm about. And so, an unpopular theme of, of, of the Bible that you're going to find, and it's certainly the theme of the book of Jonah, is that oftentimes God will send people to reach people that they don't like. Him. See, we don't think he'll ever do that to us, do we? We think, you know, God would never, God will only send me to people that I like. God will only send me to, to people that I, that I enjoy, that are just like me. But oftentimes, if you detest them, there's a really good chance God wants to send you to them. He wants to change your heart. And he wants to set you free from all the bitterness and that, the hurrah, the anger that we carry, the outrage that we carry. But he wants to send you on mission. I believe he wants to do that for some of us today in this room, watching online. He wants to set you free from all that, all that outrage, all that anger, all that need to compare. He wants you to know that you are worth dying for, that you could not be a more valuable son, a more valuable daughter. There's nothing to gain, nothing to lose, nothing to prove. And there's a mission he wants to send you to be a light, to, to be a representative of the gospel to other people. So how do we have our heart changed so we can do that? How does that happen in our lives? This is the, the takeaway this morning. I think what we have to do is stop looking at them and we have to look at Christ. This is a, this is a huge principle for heart change in our lives. I, I, this is not something you do just once. This is something you have to make a daily practice. Stop looking at who the media wants you to be outraged by. We're in an election year. We all know it's just going to get worse, right? Stop looking at who the world says are your enemies. Look at Christ. Stop, stop looking at those people who you root for to lose, who you feel like you're competing with. Even forgiveness, we talked about it last week, that the power to forgive doesn't come by looking at the person who we're upset with and trying hard to forgive them. It comes by getting our, our gaze off of them and getting our gaze fixed on Christ. When you do that, you see how much he loved you, how much he valued you, how much he died for you, how, how much his life has now been transferred to your life, and now you are living out his purpose, his identity for your life. And that's where the power to love, to forgive, to show grace. That's where it actually comes from. Look at Christ. So let's do that right now. Can we just bow our heads? Let's do that right now. So Jesus, right now we are taking our gaze off of them. And God, only you know in this room uh, or online, God, only you know them is for each one of us, but pretty much every one of us in this room has a them. So right now, Jesus, we take our gaze, our focus off of them, and we put it on you. Would you allow us to behold you again, Jesus? Would you allow us to be to behold again the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of the grace that is ours in you? Not because we did anything to earn it, not because of our good uh, merit, not because of our good deeds, but because of your grace to us. We look to that again. We ask you to change us, God. Would you would you allow us to behold you in all your glory and all your goodness until we are utterly transformed so that we can live the life that you call us to live? We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. So as we respond.
song this morning, would you take a posture of worship, whatever is most comfortable for you, standing, sitting, kneel, kneeling, and let's just be open to what the Lord has to say to us as we leave this place today.
God said. Amen. Thanks for being here with us today. Uh, if you're new um, here, if you're just joining us, we've had a lot of visitors here in the last few weeks. Uh, I think there's going to be something popping up here on the screen um, behind me. There's a QR code. We'd love to know that you're here with us, and we'd love to help you take a next step. Uh, why? Because of everything we've been talking about, this this church doesn't exist for those of us who are already here. This church exists for those of us who are not here yet. For the 53,410 people that do not know Jesus yet in this community, is that the truth? And so uh, we want to know you. We want to help you connect with Jesus, first and foremost, and then connect to his church. That's what we're hungry to do. And with uh, that being said, uh, before we go out and enjoy our evening in the Super Bowl and everything, I'd love to close this with a benediction. The word just means a blessing. If you feel comfortable extending your hands in a posture of reception, I'd just love to speak these words over you. And now, my brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, may you come to know that you were worth dying for. May your heart be completely transformed by the gospel of grace. May it get down into every part of your life and change you from the inside out. And may you be set free from the need to compare, to compete, uh, and to root for other people to lose. And may you be sent to the people in our community who are living in spiritual darkness until every single person proclaims the name of Jesus and there are zero lives unchanged. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen. Love you guys. Have a great week.